I'm talking to Jess Higgins, a PhD student at the University of Sussex. Welcome Jess, thanks Hi. for talking to me. Thanks. Um, if you had to explain what sort of scientist you were, how would you explain yourself? Well, I think first and foremost, if I think about the research that I do, I'm an organometallic chemist, so I work with metals and also sort of carbon, hydrogen, other organic uh, elements. I also work with uranium, right? so that's sort of specific in there. So um, uranium chemistry is what I do, yep. um, but uh, so inorganic stuff, so we've got air sensitive things. Um, so when I work, I work uh, with a rigorous exclusion of air and moisture, which right. can, be, can be tricky at times. Yeah, yeah. So, but the main reason for that is that we like to control the environment um, that our chemicals work in. Yep. So if you've got air or moisture coming in, then we don't know what it's going to do. So, yeah, yeah. Well, we can talk about that a bit later mm. on. Are you mainly, are you all experimental or do you have to do a bit <laughs> of theory as well? Um, well, experimental is the main thing. So my day-to-day -day routine is to, you know, come into work and I go into the lab and I will spend yeah. a lot of my time there. But yeah. all the data analysis that goes along too, yeah. so to, to work out what actually is going on in your reactions, you yeah. collect a variety of data. So there's a lot of time sitting down and working out what's going on yeah, and why yeah. that might be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and is this, um, were you interested in science when you were very young, were you sort of inspired by anything? Yeah, not, it wasn't in the original plan, so uh, when I was younger my main love was sort of English and words and drama and all that sort of thing, and science was always very fascinating, yeah. but it wasn't the thing that I was going to pursue. Right. But um, I worked for a year in a school with sort of kids between the ages of 7 and seven and 11, and we had a science week, yes. and I had to sit in the morning and I did like a morning class with them, and they had a science week board and all sort of pictures of molecules and how they relate to everyday life. Kids were really fascinated in it and they were asking me questions and uh, I, I became really inspired by that and I thought people love this and it's, it's very interesting and you know it's so much to learn and it's applicable to our everyday life yes. and I reconsidered my options and I decided to go and do a chemistry degree. Right. Um, so you must have had some science already you couldn't just go from English to No, training. no, I did uh, three A levels in English, drama and chemistry which right. is a bit of an unconventional mix but that's what I liked at the time. So. And you were lucky you went to school that let you do that mm, because absolutely. in some schools I, you know, I would have liked to have done art physics and I was, mm. I was good with my hands to making things so I would have liked to have done art for some but I, I couldn't do that I wasn't mm. allowed to. Yeah, but it's very creative. I think the creativity aspect of having stuff that the scientific um, and sort of you know or more artistic, the creativity links those things. Yeah. I think it's very important for people to do both science and artistic sort of you know pursuits. Yeah, and well, I complement. agree with you entirely. And I think at, at primary school, perhaps there is a lot more hands-on and doing, isn't yeah. there? Yeah. And when you get to a certain age, you become sort of more rigorous, and you have yeah. to do experiments, collect the data you meant you think you're meant to have. You know, whereas when you're younger, it's more about playing. Yeah. And even like sorting something by size with a sieve and learning the science behind how things fall through and different size molecules yeah. and atoms and stuff. And sometimes so. I think you can't almost do that playing until a PhD. Do you do you agree with that? Yeah, I I, I, I agree. Yeah. yeah, your degree is much more structured. Um, but as soon as you get let loose, as it were, in a lab, okay, with a few more rules than being let loose, yeah. but. My master's year is a research project, and that's when I really learnt about playing yeah. and, you know, sort of discovering and creating things. That was wonderful. Yeah, so now <laughs> you're in a lab doing a PhD, so yes. let's talk a bit about that, that mm. work, chemistry. So what I do is I work in um, Professor Cloak's research group here at the University of Sussex, yeah. and I look at organometallic uranium complexes, right. which are um, useful for things such as small molecule activation. So when I mean small molecule activation, I talk about um, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, hydrogen and ammonia, so mostly. Are, are these like waste gases from mm. industry that at the moment we just put into the air or something? Some and some. I mean, obviously carbon dioxide we hear about a lot as being, you know, greenhouse gas and yep. carbon capture and utilisation is a huge thing at the moment. Yep. You know, we want to take carbon dioxide that we release from industrial processes and actually reuse it in something yeah, useful. Yeah. So, I mean, chemical technology has been uh, working towards, you know, processes like this for years, yeah, yeah. finding new ways of changing these gases such as ammonia and, and you know, hydrogen um, into new, new products. Yeah. Um, so we're just kind of taking this from a different angle and we're working with uranium yeah. as a potential now, catalyst Now, how did you feel, I mean, maybe you knew this in advance, but mm. you suddenly to be present presented with the fact that you're going to have a project with uranium, your average person would say, that sounds a bit dangerous. <laughs> well, I think it's got a real Jekyll and Hyde character. And, you know, you, there's the interesting side to uranium and there's the scary side. I mean, OK, we all associate it um, with nuclear fuel yeah. and sort of, you know, nuclear bombs. Yeah. But, of course, that's not the only side of it. It is a metal. It's um, an actinide. It, yeah. it is in the periodic table. It's also just another element. Um, and it has some fasc fascinating chemical properties, which is why I'm so interested in it. Yeah. But um, we use depleted uranium, so it's slightly different from just using the scary, you know, enriched uranium that people think about when they yeah, think I mean, about Yeah, I mean, where did you get it from? Itself. I went on eBay and mm. I looked, if you put buying uranium on eBay, 
Uh, Surprising the results you get. There's not a lot on there, although you can get pitch blend, which is uranium yes. oxide. Yeah, which is obviously a natural source. Yeah. yeah, and that's got various different isotopes of uranium in it. Yes, it does. So there's a few isotopes of uranium, and the two that are sort of the, the most um, well, the most common are uranium-238 and T35. Yeah. So when you make your enriched uranium, you try and enrich the content of T35. I think right. naturally it's about 0.7%, um, and about the other 99% is T38. Right. So um, when you go through the enriching process, you get isotope separation. The lighter isotopes are the ones that you want, and the uranium-238 is the ones that you don't want so much. And this, this depleted the, stuff that's is the one that we use. That's used for the power generation. Um, the 235 is used for denuclear fission. Okay. Yep, and, and T38 is the and, depleted. And that's the one you use. Yes. It's still radioactive, presumably. Yes, it's got a long it is. I think it's five times ten to the nine years. So, you know, we're talking like the age of the earth, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, in terms of its actual sort of dosing and yeah. radiation danger, I mean, in the lab we treat it as though you would any other toxic or poisonous metal. So, if yeah. imagine it was lead, you wouldn't go about and handle it without gloves or without safety precautions. And do you get it as the metal or a compound? We get it um, as both. We get uranium turnings, but we can also um, use uranium oxide. And depending on what starting material we're going to make. So, the two main starting materials we make are uranium tetrachloride and mm -hmm. uranium triiodide so depending which route it is yeah so, so you get the turnings and that's uh, it just comes as a metal from somewhere yep. Yep. not from eBay no it comes from the National Lu Nuclear Laboratory right. which is a place which obviously has a lot of depleted uranium um, and, and they just store it there do they, they, they well they will store some of it I mean obviously with their research it, it's, a, it's a byproduct um, but one of the nice things is that we can actually take the stuff that is essentially waste people don't want depleted uranium yeah, no, you know no, yeah. and we can actually try and use it for something useful yeah. so that, that's really is in the heart of, of what we do and so you're making molecules that are going to take something like carbon dioxide yeah because it's very stable mm. you need something quite harsh whatever the expression is exactly to break it up so you can do yeah. things so can we talk a bit about that yeah How is absolutely it? well um i mean you've got carbon monoxide so that's that's the big example because it has the strongest bond in nature you right. know it's it's a triple bonded species so you can sort of imagine the two molecules of carbon and the oxygen quite you know rigorously bound together yeah. the fact that we can um take uranium which is oxophilic which means it, it loves oxygen so that's why uranium oxide exists yeah. and in ores, you know, it's always you've got an oxide form. Yeah. If we can exploit the fact that it loves oxygen, you could quite imagine the oxygen in that CO molecule sort of being attracted to the uranium. That's going to have a result on the CO molecule right. that will change the bonding it and sort of, you know, maybe make it into a weaker bond, which then allows for us to maybe um, add on to that sort of building block, as it were. Right. So uh, that, that's, that's a big example. And carbon dioxide is the same. It's obviously got two oxygen um, atoms in it. So again attracted to uranium. So the, the, obviously the carbon monoxide is a gas? Yes, that's correct. And, and, these, and the uranium compound is, is a liquid or, or a solid or...? We can, well they, we usually make them as solids but we can dissolve them so we'll have them in solution. And then you bubble the gas through it? Basically. Yes, exactly. So there's, that... gone, there's two ways that we can do this and one is um, we can add a stoichiometric so one molecule of gas for one molecule of our complex and yeah. we can literally see the one molecule change which is wonderful, yeah. um, very fascinating to see or as you say we can pass an excess of gas through something. And I think we've got a, a clip here of you in the lab. Oh, yes. Um, now, these uh, chemicals are air sensitive, aren't they? They are. So you have yeah. to do them in uh, a piece of equipment <laughs> <laughs> that's got no air around. <laughs> exactly. So this is, a, this is a glove box here. So it's a bit like when you see the Simpsons episodes at the beginning. And OK, they are handling uranium, but it's, it doesn't glow. No. Um, and they use a glove box. They've got these big rubber gloves that you can push into an environment, um, such as this one here, which is full of argon. Right. So argon being an inert gas will not react, well, allegedly, yeah, yeah. will not react um, with our compounds. Yes. And so we have a box with this with argon in it and one with nitrogen as well. Right. Um, but we pass things in and out through air locks. So we have two different chambers with two doors either side. So you have the indoor closed yep. most of all the time. You open the outside door, you can put something in, close it and then you can pull vacuum yes. and then replace the atmosphere with argon yep. or nitrogen. And it all takes a long time. And do it a couple of times and make sure you really have done it and it's all okay because otherwise... I, I do remember <laughs> using these in the lab and getting the order wrong sometimes mm. and then you have to leave the whole thing to pump down. It's a bit of a nightmare. It's when you get that alarm going off and you go, oh, is that me? <laughs> oh. <laughs> is there any kind of idea or principle or technique that you've come across that you think is really inspired you in science or help you understand mm. it? Or? Well, I, th I think the, the main image for me is um, something my chemistry teacher told me when I was about 16 years old. And he said, oh, chemistry is like a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. And it, it sort of sunk in at the time, but I think as I've gone through, it's more and more apt. Um, all chemistry and all science builds on top of prior knowledge and it sort of all links together in ways that are often unexpected. Yep. There are so many cross-disciplinary um, research groups and they, they all span biochemistry, chemistry, you know, physics, you'll get a whole range of things and mm. you're understanding things by taking things as building blocks and as jigsaw puzzle pieces and you're making a greater view of the world yep. and I think that, that really has inspired me. So 
okay, so my research is very, very specific and, you know, it's, it's a tiny, tiny piece, but it's still a puzzle piece. Yeah. And someone may be able to take something from that which will expand someone else's knowledge of science and hopefully contribute. Thank you very much for talking Thank to me. You. There's a link uh, coming up at the, uh, at the end of this uh, mm -hmm. film of a little video describing your research in more detail. But thanks yeah. very much. Thank you.